This is home, right. Yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to say hi. Yes, hello, are. hello. Yeah. I'll I'll take myself off now. I'm, I was to be here, but I'll stop my video. Well, I, I, I think it's nice when people have videos on. Oh, do you? <laughs> uh -huh. No, it's, it's one of these challenging things about Zoom talks. You just have no idea how the audience is responding. I mean, once I screen share my slides, I really won't be able to see very much anyway, but at least yes. uh, until then. Yeah, Hi, Amy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, I can say hello and hey. um, pretend that we are together. Yeah, it's just sort of talking into the sort of screen. I mean, one's got used one's got used to it over the last couple of years, but it's we had our we had our research day at UCL yesterday. Uh -huh. uh, it was really really good. To have virtually the entire department mm. start research students in one place, talking, interacting, having tea, and so on, which was, um, mm -hmm. which was really good. And so finding out what people are doing after two years. <laughs> right, everything should be running smoothly now, Hasek. Did you want to share your screen again? And um, should I just yeah? Do that? At the moment on YouTube, all we've got is everyone's faces. Ah, uh, right. <laughs> Which I'm sure people would like to see our faces, but they'd probably rather see the start of your presentation. And it oh, I don't. More than that it's I mean, about to start. So. The, the cover, the title page isn't that interesting, but. Uh, so that's how it would. Yeah, work. that's come up as slideshow. That's brilliant. Yeah, is that good? Yeah, no, Should that's just... fine. Becky's nodding. That's fine. All right, so I'll just so keep it like that. Keep it like that. That's wonderful. Uh -huh. And um, I will, um, I will take my microphone off now, and I will leave you in Frank's capable hands. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Looking forward to the talk, Hasek. Thank you. When's the book out, Hasek? Oh, this book is not even in yet. So I, I'm hoping to submit the manuscript by the end of the summer. Okay. Right. Yeah, and then surely the referees will tell me to do 600 things, including what well, I... I will be looking through Faraday's correspondence, but... Um, they will tell me to do 600 other things, which I probably can't do, so. Yeah, yeah. Who's, who are you sending it to? Chicago. Chicago, okay, right, yeah. Yeah, it's meant to uh, be judged for the synthesis series. Ah, okay, right. Yeah. I mean, I think they will probably take it in the end, but... I'm, I'm expecting revisions, so it's it's uh, it's going to be an unusual book, as well as uh, one that I'm not going to really finish researching because it's just too big and I I can't finish it. So you know, I try to get it to a coherent enough shape, but yeah. Uh, well, I've started um, writing my big book on Davy, mm. and so far I've got 10,000 words, and I've got Davy aged 15 with his first girlfriend, <laughs> and um, tomorrow I'm going to, uh, she was French, a French refugee, uh -huh. uh, going to National Archives tomorrow and hope, hopefully to find some files on, at least one file, yeah. on her to tell me a bit more about, about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Frank, I, I've just got to step out for two minutes, but I will right, be right. literally back in two. Okay, right. That sounds really interesting, Frank. Are you looking up the refugees from that period or the particular person? The, the particular person or persons, because mm -hmm. he was also taught French by a refugee priest from oh. Brittany, and at least John Paris claimed he spoke French with a Breton accent, which, as you can imagine, did not go down too well in Paris when Davy <laughs> turned up there. Um, 
Can we? I don't think we need a single word that Paris says. <laughs> <laughs> right. Have you, have you ever read Paris's biography of Davy? No, sorry. It's an extraordinary book. It is just so anti-Davy. One just wonders why he put so much effort into rubbishing Davy. It's just. Yes, well, there doesn't awful. seem to be any rhyme or reason spending all that time writing something and, and not liking the character. Well, I mean, it's not, I mean, I don't like David particularly, but I'm not going to rubbish him in the way that Paris... Uh, mm, strange, uh, strange. Hmm. Yeah, but also you're finding out different things, I mean, that uh, and doing a different type of research. So I think that, that is very interesting yeah. and helpful. I mean, when you when you start looking at things in detail, it's amazing how many stories just fall to pieces. Um, oh yes, uh, I know, I know. The, uh, particularly in the archives, you inherit many stories, and you go back to the files. And you think that's not true at all. Where did that come from? You know, what the, the things people have written. Um, and and people interpret things in so many different ways. I think apart from anything else, or misremember, or can't remember, write, read their notes or something. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. Yes, it's the misremembering that's the problem. Uh, absolute confidence. So so. Yeah. so yes, and then you go back and go, oh, no, that wasn't the case. That's why I always say to researchers, please go and have a lunch break because you can't possibly concentrate. On a lot of files all day, and get me yeah. from. Actually, I made, I made quite a nice discovery in the in the BL today. I found a whole cache of letters from Lady Davies' uncle to Lord Spencer. Oh, very interesting. Which I want to want to look at. I want the, the author papers are organised in date order, so I just can't call up this whole cache. I've got to sort of order about six different files. Oh, that's frustrating. Read the letters, but uh, there we are. It's just, mm. yeah. Well, that's new work anyway. Yeah, so I was quite pleased with that. I mm. hope they're going to talk about Lady Davy or talk about getting Lady Davy's father off the uh, corruption charges that he would have undoubtedly faced had he lived, which he didn't. Mm. Um, anyway, so it's five o'clock. So welcome, uh, everyone, to our May Shack seminar which we're continuing um even though the pandemic is now officially over um, the, um and the parties are officially over and all that sort of thing have come to an end uh, but we since, since they've been successful we're going to sort of carry on uh into the into the foreseeable future uh with them could everybody mute if they're not already mute if you're on uh zoom and you have a question please type it in uh, to the chat box, and I'll um, call the person at the uh, uh, at the end to uh, ask the question. If you're on YouTube, uh, again, type it into um, the chat box, but that will need to be conveyed to me as it as it will be, and I'll read the question uh, question out. Um, so this month, we've got. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome Hasek Chang, um, who is now. Hanswell Singh Professor of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge, but before then worked at my own institution, University uh, College of London, um, where he wrote a couple of extremely well-received uh, books, Is Water H2O, Evidence, Realism and Pluralism, published in 2012, and uh, then uh, Inventing Temperature, Measurement and Scientific Progress in two, 2004. Quite why I went them out in that order, I'm not entirely sure. But... There we are. Um, he is a co-founder for the Philosophy of Science in Practice, SPSP, and the Committee for Integrated History and Philosophy of Science. And for the past few years, he's been working on the history of the electric battery. And he's going to talk to us for about half an hour or so um, on how a battery works, four systems of battery science in the 19th century. Hasek. Thank you very much, Frank, and thank you all for being here. It's great to see some old friends on the screen and some new names as well. Um, so, Frank, I trust you'll find a way to let me know if the sound or 
um, slides or anything, and it goes funny. So I'll just talk into the ether, trusting that it will all be fine. So um, thanks again for inviting me to this series. And I'm going to try to give you a flavor of this book I've been working on for some time, which I'm hoping to finish writing this summer. And I, I'm going to go at a good clip because uh, um, it's a half hour talk and I don't intend to stop for very uh, much of a leisurely discussion, but hopefully if there is something you want me to expand on during the questions, I will do that. So, you know, the, the first thing I do want to say is why should anyone bother about the history of batteries? And I'm just going to quote an authority here. Uh, Giuliano Pancaldi in his uh, wonderful biography of Volta said that by inventing the battery, um, Volta's work opened up a limitless field of science which transformed our civilization. And I don't think he was exaggerating, right? The key thing about the battery is that it created steady electric currents flowing through electric circuits. I mean, that doesn't exist in nature, right? And until the invention of the battery, the only thing in electricity was basically static charge being suddenly discharged and not many useful things one can do with that. But with the electric circuits and currents that are steady, you could do everything from electrochemistry to electromagnetism, run telegraph networks and all the rest of it. So yes, our modern technological civilization does ultimately will rest on batteries. Uh, as we all know, uh, this is the work of Volta, um, his invention of the so-called voltaic pile, first publicized in 1800. And it was a very, very easy instrument to make, which most people who tried could even do at home, just a piling up of metallic alternating pieces of two different metals with something wet separating the metallic pairs. But it was very, very difficult to understand how this thing generated these wonderful effects. Now, if you know a little bit about this history, you know that Volta's own conception of how the battery worked was not what we now think in basic science. So, the very title of the paper in which he announced his discovery in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society was very instructive, right? The paper was called On the Electricity Excited by the Mere Contact of Conducting Substances of Different Kinds. There's Volta's old theory in summary, right? He thought that the um, exciting of electricity was due to just the contact of different substances. So here's uh, his own picture of the structure of the pile. And he thought that this zinc silver pair, which was the original materials he used, the contact generated this flow of the electrical fluid. And then why do you have the wet layer? That's just to separate the metallic pairs while conducting the electricity so that you could accumulate the effect being generated by all of these units. Now, you probably also know that um, Volta's view was almost immediately countered by this so-called chemical theory of batteries, right, which saw the action at the chemical reaction between the wet stuff, which they then later called the electrolyte, and one of the metals, in this case, zinc, reacting with the salt water that was in Volta's wet layers. So why do you have the copper uh, or silver or any of the less reactive metals? Well, it's just to conduct the electricity generated by the um, chemical reaction. So, this is the standard uh, 
view now we have, right, of how batteries work, the chemical theory. Uh, we, the, all the school children in chemistry classes in secondary school and early university classes get this picture of what we call the Daniel cell, right, which I'll come back to in just a moment. And this is a chemical machine with different reactions happening on both two sides and the dominant reaction drives the electricity in one direction rather than the other. Now, if you know something about this, if you know a little bit about the history of batteries, what you know is, right, Volta had this idea uh, that, that the action was due to the contact of different substances and that this view was then defeated by the chemical theory, which we now know is the correct theory. So what I'm trying to do, I mean, I'm trying to do many things in this book. Uh, the angle I'm going to emphasize today is that I am offering a revisionist history of batteries and uh, what I'm calling broadly battery science. What, what people used to call in the early 19th century as the area of galvanism. Right. Um, so the first revisionist point I want to emphasize through my my retelling of the story is that it wasn't just a case of the chemical theory supported by the likes of Faraday, earlier Wollaston. It didn't simply triumph over the contact theory. And here's another authority, uh, Helia Krau, who can be generally trusted to tell us the right stories, right? His very instructive paper of 2000 uh, tells us reminds us, right, that there was this huge long controversy about the workings of the voltaic battery that lasted throughout the 19th century. And he reminds us that it wasn't truly resolved even coming into the 20th century. So at the least we have to do is to recognize that there was this um, long debate and why would there have been a long debate because the Volt volta side that the contact theory side was not simply wrong or stupid or mistaken there were very good reasons for volta to think that contact between two different substances generated electrical action and here's what uh, a modern picture illustrating what people then often called volta's fundamental experiment this was showing that putting two different metals together actually got them to electrically charge with opposite signs. So in, in this picture, you, you're shown a piece of silver and piece of sil gold. And what happens when you put them together is some electrons migrate over from the silver to the gold until equilibrium is established. And then when you separate them again, you can detect with an electrometer that they are charged to opposite signs. So Volta had done this experiment even before inventing the pile and the pile was a mechanism to multiply this effect. And to the people who insist that no, no, what's operative in the voltaic pile is the chemical reaction between the wet stuff and one of the metals, People on the context side had this response. You can, well, sorry, make uh, this thing that they called the dry pile, just like the voltaic pile, but without, instead of using the wet non-metallic layer, completely dry metallic, non-metallic layer. So it could be dry pieces of paper or pieces of leather even, and, um, these dry piles are real. They have a long history of actually being able to produce various effects. And then came in 1821, the invention of the thermocouple by Zeebeck. And the thermocouple in the simplest configuration is simply a loop made of two wires of different metals, cadmium and so on. And you, so you have two junctions, which you put at different temperatures and current flows, right? So the way to understand this is, right, there's no chemistry here going on. The, each of the bimetallic junctions has this 
contact potential, as the Volta people called it. And the contact potential is a function of temperature. So at different temperatures, they would have different values. So current flows in one direction rather than the other. And this thermocouple was the battery that was used by Ohm when he did the experiments to establish Ohm's law. So, I mean, an experiment and the apparatus used for it doesn't get any more important than this, right? So there, there are lots of important achievements of the voltaic tradition and work on the contact potential so-called continues to this day, right? This picture I showed you earlier comes from this paper of 2016, um, trying to make modern sense of the contact potential in terms of the Fermi level that is uh, different in each kind of metal. So it wasn't just um, that the contact theory was wrong, chemical theory was right. Another way in which I want to complicate the story is to see this controversy not merely as a competition between two theories, but between what I call entire systems of practice. What is this notion is something I uh, started using in, in my book on water. It's a um, unit of analysis that I favor um, when I try to say what, what are we talking about when we talk about different traditions in the history of science? I mean, it's not that different from Kuhnian paradigms, but there are reasons I don't want to use paradigms. So I say a system of practice is a coherent and interacting set of epistemic activities. So there's an emphasis on scientific traditions as doing rather than um, just pieces of information or theory. So anyway, so I say rather than looking at this history as the competition between the contact theory and the chemical theory, I, I look at it as a competition between two systems of practice, which I have called the contact electrostatic system. That's the one coming from Volta's original work. And this other thing, which I call the chemical imbalance system. And the idea of that, going back to, right, the voltaic pile is people are saying, look, um, yeah, there, there's chemical stuff going on between the electrolyte and each of the metals, but the chemical reaction going on between the electrolyte and the zinc in this case is much more powerful or stronger than the chemical reaction going on between the wet stuff and the copper. And then once you get this idea, it became almost impossible to avoid inventing new kinds of batteries, right? Because any material system, right, in which you had two sides, in which different chemical reactions could happen at different strength would make a battery. And it did so, right? So looking at Volta's original arrangement, oh, you can try all kinds of metallic combinations right, instead of his original silver and zinc. I mean, any two metals made a battery and you could use all kinds of electrolytes, right? His original one was plain water and then salt water and people started using acids and alkalis. I mean, almost anything works. I have been doing this in the lab. It's great fun. And people like Davy had a lot of fun inventing all kinds of batteries. Right. And people like Davy also argued against Volta, saying we don't even need two metals. We can have just one metal reacting at different ends with different electrolytes. That also makes a battery. Hey, you don't even need two electrolytes. You can have one type of metal dipped in the same kind of electrolyte at different ends, just different concentrations of the same stuff. So here's my own little reproduction of that idea of a concentration cell. So two little test tubes containing different concentrations of hydrochloric acid, zinc wire dipped in each, makes a respectable voltage of about 0.1. 
so the proliferation of all these chemical cells, but what was difficult, oh, right, yeah, this is, you don't even need any metals at all. This is a, one of my favorite pictures uh, of Galvani's nephew, Aldini, who liked to amuse people by demonstrations. And this is him making a battery out of three animals, one himself, one the cow, and a frog leg. And when this circuit was made, the frog leg was seen to jump. Okay, you can almost connect any three things and make a battery. And here's a, a little beautiful experiment from Faraday, um, which I can go into in more detail. Uh, but Faraday was one of these people who tried to make more precise and demonstrate more clearly that this idea that different chemical reactions could have different strength or powers, because when you think about it, that's not a precise notion, right? So Faraday did this wonderful little experiment, plate of platinum, plate of zinc, and in one, first he put some sulfuric acid to connect the two, and then by making a metallic connection at the other end, I hope you can see the cursor moving around, pointing to different points. He made a little battery because the plat uh, zinc was reacting with the sulfuric acid. And then he did this other one in which he put a potassium iodide solution between the two metals. And then he showed the current flowed in the opposite direction. And then he did the one at the bottom, which was now to dispensing with the metallic connections. He linked up these two metallic plates on one side with sulfuric acid, on the other side with potassium iodide. And he could show that it was the sulfuric acid side reaction that drove the whole thing. So potassium iodide, instead of reacting normally with zinc, right, instead got acted on with the consequence that iodine came out and Davy could show that beautiful little experiment. Um, Davy, I said Davy, Faraday. Um, but then it was still not clear in what sense do we have a stronger reaction on one side that was able to overcome the other. And to cut a long story short, the modern answer is it's the chemical potential, right? This is how we make sense of the Daniel cell. And in this setup, what we're dealing with is the redox potential, right? How much does the each metal want to become ionized. And we say zinc has a stronger tendency to ionize than copper. And that's how we explain the voltage of the Daniel cell shown here. So what I want to spend the uh, next several minutes just talking about in slight detail is how we arrived at this. And it does become with it does begin with the work of John Frederick Daniel, the first professor of chemistry at King's College London, who invented this thing, right, which he called the constant battery. But he didn't invent it with the notion of chemical potential. I mean, that comes much, much later. What he was trying to do in the first instance was to just make a steady kind of voltaic type cell. So, um, in during Daniel's time, which is 1830s, um, this is the commonest type of battery. It, it's the same configuration in the end as the voltaic cell, but Wollaston put it into this liquid-based um, configuration. So you got two different metals, zinc and copper in this picture, dipped into an electrolyte. And here, um, if you use hydric uh, hydrochloric acid as the electrolyte, you have the consequence that, yes, zinc ions get pulled out, um, leaving some loose electrons, which then go over to the copper side, come out into the solution, meet the hydrogen ions, and make hydrogen gas. And in the process, electricity flows. I'm sorry about the cheating with semi-modern uh, conceptions, but that's a basic picture. And then the problem that Daniel was trying to solve was an extremely practical one, which is that 
this nice battery stops working well after a while because a lot of the hydrogen gas forming doesn't go up into the air. It forms bubbles that stick on the copper surface, reducing the effective area of copper electrode. And then because there are zinc ions in the solution accumulating as well, eventually the zinc ions will go and meet the electrons here and coat the copper with zinc, in which case the, the whole thing just stops. You got zinc and zinc on both sides. So how is Daniel trying to resolve solve this problem? There, there's some standard works you can refer to, but this is what he did. So that's his original picture from the 1836 paper. The first practical thing he did was to, to maximize the area of the copper electrode by using um, a container, a copper cylinder as the container and outer electrode. And then he put zinc in the form of a stick in that electrolyte, but this is the crucial bit. He divided the electrolyte into two parts. I don't know if you can read this here. It says ox gullet. So he was using the esophagus of an ox, a cow, to as a semi-permeable barrier, which would allow electrical conduction, but block certain ions. And he found that it blocked the zinc coming out from the zinc electrode going over to the copper, nice. And then the crucial innovation after that was to say, right, so initially the whole space is filled with sulfuric acid in, in this case. He said, it is the use of the acid that generates the hydrogen bubbles on the copper electrode. So he said, Let, let's prevent that. And he had this idea, we could use copper sulfate instead of sulfuric acid. And that worked out beautifully. And it, there was no hydrogen bubbles accumulating on the copper. Instead, you got fresh deposit of metallic copper, which kept the electro el electrode really intact. Wonderful. And then the next thing, which is also crucial. So initially he said, right, as the reaction goes on, the zinc dissolves into the sulfuric acid, which is in the inner compartment here. And he wanted to remove the zinc. So he had this siphoning mechanism to suck the zinc out. And then as it happened, that siphoning failed, zinc was accumulating, and he noticed that didn't make a difference. The battery still worked just as well. So he said, aha, uh -huh, I don't need to remove the zinc. And he said, what is sulfuric acid with a lot of zinc dissolved in it? It's zinc sulfate. So he said, I'm just going to use zinc sulfate. And nice that I don't have to deal with an acid. So that's how we come to the configuration of the modern Daniel cell at the end of this very practical investigative process which was aimed at just producing something stable. He didn't have a theory about how this worked. Oh, and the final step is to, to, uh, uh, was to replace the biological membrane with something a lot uh, less messy to handle. So unglazed porcelain did the trick. So we got this configuration. And then um, for many decades, Daniel cell is really useful. People use it a lot. It even becomes a practical unit of voltage, but it's not presented all over the textbooks as it is today as the mechanism of batteries, right? That happens only very gradually over the decades. And here's a glimpse at that process. So, you know, if you look at the modern explanation of how the Daniel cell works, we have these standard electrode potential values. Now, how, where do we get these values? And I was brought up to imagine that you could theoretically calculate these values, and that's not at all true, right? <laughs> you have to just measure them in a phenomenological way against the hydrogen electrode. So, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but 
just to note that they had to do another instrumental innovation for this uh, new conceptual scheme of the Daniel cell to settle down. And only then they had the all the essential elements of what I'm calling the chemical um, imbalance system. So it's a kind of science which I've called amalgamated uh, in the book. I can say more about that if people want, in which uh, all these different types of elements of knowledge, instruments, theories, experimental methods, practical technology, they're, they're blended seamlessly and they develop through this mutual interaction and reliance. So the conceptual foundation of this battery science only arose from Daniel making a very practical, stable instrument, and then people trying to make theoretical sense of how that works. And it's this kind of very syn synthetic, blended, complex process. So that's uh, in, a, in a rather long description, the second point. It's not just theories competing with each other, but this whole system of practice developing. And I wanted to illustrate that by giving you a little bit of detail there about how the chemical imbalance system came to be. But the two more points, layers of revision, which I'll do very briefly, one is that it wasn't just these two competing systems, but I've identified as many as four, at least four. What I call the conservationist system is linked with the rising idea of energy conservation and the interconversion of different forms of energy and the crucial iconic instrument in that system is the rechargeable battery, right? Starting with Grove's accidental invention of, of the gas battery, which is the ancestor of today's hydrogen fuel cell. So there's a whole other system of practice that developed in parallel um, with number one and two here. And there is yet another one, which was the tradition of trying to give microscopic corpuscular mechanical explanation of what's going on. So that begins almost immediately in the works of people like Grotus, Davy, Berzelius, uh, and then eventually comes to fruition with the Arrhenius ionic theory and chemical thermodynamics and all the rest of that. And then finally, um, I also note, and this is the entire second half of the book, uh, in which I note that even if you identify these four different systems, there were still important problems that couldn't be solved in any one of these four systems. And various ad hoc integration between these different systems was needed. And I'm going to finish because my time is nearly up by just quickly illustrating what kind of thing I'm talking about. And the example I want to give you is Volta's original type of battery, right? So I just quickly passed over this picture earlier, but there's the question, right? Okay, let's accept that in an acid, maybe the anions, the negative ions in the acid would pull out the zinc ions, loosening these free electrons. But there's a question as to why these electrons would then go over all the way to the other side to meet the hydrogen ions in the acid. Because there are plenty of hydrogen ions over on the zinc side where the electrons are being produced. So why don't they meet the electrons, uh, hydrogen ions there? And wonderfully, uh, more than 100 years later in 1916, Irving Langmuir, the, the renowned surface chemist, um, revisited this whole question. And this Langmuir gave this whole intriguing picture in which he expresses the idea of the charging by contact that was the subject of Volta's fundamental experiment more than a century earlier. And Langmuir accepted Volta's basic idea and said, okay, here you have a piece of zinc, 
piece of copper, they would become charged simply by contact. But that's as far as it goes, because in this gap, um, you just have no action going on. And then Langmuir said, if you would put an electrolyte in this gap, right, then ions would move and try to neutralize these built up charges, yet more movement of electrons would happen at the zinc copper interface, and this would keep the current running. And uh, my former UCL colleague, Darren Karana, I don't think he knew about Langmuir. He's been working on what he calls the flame battery for all of these years, uh, which is to say, yeah, you can put a liquid electrolyte in that space, but you can also put a flame, which is a mixture of ions, right? So he does this demonstration of setting this kind of thing up and it, it puts a gas flame into that space and suddenly you have a battery running. So just flash you here, a couple of Darren's papers. Uh, he doesn't know I'm advertising this to you. I'm, I'm gonna go back and talk to him. But the way to make sense of the Caruana Langmuir kind of story, which I personally think makes the most sense is not in any of the four systems within each one. You need to pull together three of the systems, namely Volta's original one, which talks about the contact electrification and contact potential. Then you need the energy story from system three, because what you have to explain is, right, the um, ions existing in the electrolyte carry the higher states of energy, which are then used to drive the current in the end. And then you have to use something from the uh, corpuscular mechanical system in order to tell the story about these ions and electrons. Uh, curiously, this just leaves out the chemical imbalance uh, system, which is odd because that's supposed to be the orthodox electrochemical story today of how batteries work. So there are several other stories like this, which I tell in the second half of the book, uh, which tells you the story really is more and more complicated uh, than you might have imagined. And I guess that's what I often take pleasure in, uh, in doing history of science, to pick the simplest things in science up and show just how much of a wonderful mess um, they are. So I'm going to stop here. I've exceeded my time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Hasek. That, that was super. And I really can't wait to read the, um, read the book. Um, we have one comment in Zoom chat. I uh, let me look at the chat. I don't know right. where we are with um, um, YouTube, but uh, Becky will let me know. Nevertheless, I shall exercise my chair's normal prerogative and ask the first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just wondering if you've got any view about how conscious the actors were, people like Davy, Faraday, Daniel Grove, um, Ampere, Gorsas, all those sort of people, how conscious they were about the, the sort of different varieties of practice. Did they sort of say, right, I am in this group and not in that group, or is it, is it, a, is it a sort of more unconscious process? Yeah, so the systems of practice are my imposition, if you want, right? They were, the practitioners were very conscious about the fight between the chemical perspective and the contact perspective. They talk about that all the time. And people who start talking about energy are very conscious that they're talking about that. I mean, people, so Grove and Faraday are named, right, as you know, Frank, among the 12 people that Kuhn talks about as simultaneous independent discoverers of energy conservation. So they're very excited about the interconversion of um, forces, as they call them. So there, there's a clear awareness, right, that there are different ways of looking at these phenomena. 
and the different theoretical ways of making sense of them. But I think the systematic nature, right, which I articulate more than the actors themselves have, um, that may have been uh, quite often unconscious, as you put it. Okay. Uh, right, Luigi Fabrizzi, which I hope I've spelt, pron spelt, spelt pronounced correctly. Um, you're on Zoom somewhere. Yes. Yeah. You could uh, unmute. Of course, um, we, this wouldn't be complete without uh, contribution from Pavia. Luigi, you're you're not mute. You're muted. You're muted. Now, now, do yes, now. Oh, no, you're yeah, muted yeah. again. Okay, so while Luigi sorts out his uh, uh, speaker, um, there's a question on YouTube from Eric Seri who asks The modern cell diagram often shows a salt bridge rather than a porous membrane. Uh -huh. What difference does the former make? Yeah, um, the effect isn't very different, right? The point of either the salt bridge or the uh, porous membrane is to allow some electrical conduction and they do it in different ways, right? The salt bridge does it by just delaying the actual transport of ions from one side to the other by this having long um, intermediate area. Uh, how the porous membrane exactly works is quite um, wondrous to me because apparently, right, uh, in, in the original Daniel setup, these membranes allow the passage of the sulfate ions, but not the zinc ions. And I would have thought zinc ions were smaller, but, you know, that's not how that goes. But the effect to, to answer Eric's question is essentially the same, whichever method you use. Okay. Luigi, you're online now, are you? Yes, can you, yes. Can you hear me? Can yes, you hear me? yes, yes. Yeah. thank you. Okay. So I'm Luigi Fabrizzi, Department of Chemistry, University of Pavia. And Pavia, University of Pavia is the university, as you know, where uh, Alessandro Volta was professor of natural uh, philosophy, mm -hmm. now physics. Uh, unfortunately, he had uh, a good friend, uh, a colleague, uh, professor of general chemistry, as uh, he was uh, until a few years ago there. And uh, he was the first one who could uh, operate uh, with the pile, which uh, was given to, to, to Brugnatelli, is the name of that professor of general chemistry, by uh, Alessandro Volta. It's uh, noted that at that time the University of Pavia was closed in view of the, of the war between mm. Napoleon and the Austrian. So Alessandro Volta was not able to work in his nice lab at the University of Pavia, mm. but in the kitchen of his uh, farm, house in yeah. the country uh, near to Como. Yeah. So, yes, but I am, I have appreciated the effort of uh, Dr. Jean to give uh, an explanation of how the, the P pile, uh, the uh, Volta's pile work, but it is not correct, I'm sorry, because uh, the, the, the piece of, of, of cotton or, which, or, or, the, or the paper who interfaced the, the uh, electrodes, mm. copper and uh, silver or copper, or no, uh, zinc, zinc and silver, yes. or zinc and, and, uh, uh, and uh, copper, was uh, imbibed by, not by an acid, by sodium chloride. So the pH of the solution was seven. So it wasn't, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the process at the electrode was water plus electron, which is hydrogen from oxidation state plus one is used to oxidation state zero. 
that mean that hydrogen developed, which is something that uh, Daniel realized. Mm. But another point, uh, which can be explained only by the fact that uh, the, the, the solution was uh, neutral, is that uh, on uh, developing uh, hydrogen, also hydroxide ions were mm -hmm. formed mm -hmm. and uh, zinc hydroxide precipitated and most of it on the surface on the on the uh, uh, on the zinc electrode which stopped the the uh, the process it, this was something realized not only by was realized also by daniel mm -hmm. one of the reasons and, and, and daniel in fact uh, said in his paper that uh, yes there are two, two problems to, to, to with uh, with the two troubles with the, mm -hmm. with the volta spine the yeah. development yeah. of hydrogen and Absolutely. the formation of the solid pressure so by the way i have published uh, yes i, I, I have, know i know uh, yes. you know what you sent me you, you sent me your sorry, sorry that you don't mention probably you didn't learn the, the, the lesson because uh, for the first time i have reported in a paper on uh, Anke van de Chemie, which is in an obscure uh, uh, journal of chemistry, probably a uh, philosopher of science, uh, don't, 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 uh, don't uh, read that, but I have sent you a copy. And it's, it's clearly said how really the Volta spile work. That's right, the, thank you, the, thank the, you. The, no, 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 let, let, me, let me answer, right, because yeah, please, yeah. time's passing. Indeed, it makes a very, important difference that Volta's original electrolyte was sodium chloride mostly, sea salt, right? And I wasn't talking about that in the latter part of my presentation. I was talking about what became the most common voltaic type battery, which used acid, right? So that's what I was referring to as the volta Wollaston type, which is where Daniel started his work. Daniel didn't start with the original voltaic cell with the salt water. So yeah, the working out how the original Volta type cell worked, that's a different story indeed. Thank you. Okay, I've got four people with hands up. So I'll take them in the order that they hands went up. So Alan Rock first. Alan, could you demute? Demute. <laughs> Yes. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much, Hasok. Uh, terrific talk. And uh, I also am very interested in reading your book when it comes out. I've always found electrochemistry quite mysterious uh, from the beginning. And the history of electrochemistry uh, is a, a massive, for, for me, has been a massive confusion. So um, I, I look forward to your Thank you. <laughs> to straighten that out. Uh, when I did a project on Hermann, Kohl, Hermann Kopp, mm. uh, who was a master of chemical uh, theory, uh, physical chemical theory in the 19th century, I was surprised in the 1880s uh, that Kopp was still um, putting forward as the best explanation of the electrochemical cell this idea of Grotus mm -hmm. at that time, almost a hundred years old. So you didn't say much, you didn't say anything about, about that uh, explanation, but it provides an easy explanation for why things happen at the electrodes and not throughout the, throughout the solution as a whole in that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So I, I wonder if you could um, elaborate just a little bit on the surprising uh, long-lived character of this uh, explanation. Grotus had, had a kind of a, a dance-like movement between, yes, yeah, yeah. It, the, between the molecules so that only the ends of the chain uh, would, mm -hmm. uh, would release uh, the, uh, the chemical products. Thank you, Alan. Uh, so Grotus belongs uh, squarely in the fourth system of practice that I mentioned, but didn't go into the, the corpuscular mechanical. And I mean, as you know very well, Alan, um, Grotus drew these pictures of atoms before Dalton's theory even was published, right? So that's one thing I note about the contribution made by this system of electrochemical uh, battery science. But 
Grotus was focused on explaining the mechanism of electrolysis, right? About explaining how the battery worked, his story wasn't as effective, right? So because, um, you know, bef- until at least Arrhenius, the story of electrolysis is also very murky, Grotus, I think, frankly, what was still the best option. Uh, and that, I think, is what Kopp was uh, referring to. But when it came to explaining how the battery worked, um, so, you know, Sean Bine, for example, tries to pick up the Grotus type chain and try to give an account of how the battery works. Uh, Klaus uh, Rutenberg told me about this. And that's not terribly successful, right? So in the corpuscular mechanical system, they never got very far with explaining how the battery itself worked. They were much better at explaining how the effects of the battery were um, displayed, yeah. Okay, Alok Trivastava, who I've got that more or less right. Could you mute? Yeah, I was hoping you would let Jane and George go ahead, but let me take the chance. Um, <clears throat> You were first. Uh, I was like, I, I, I wanted to push a little bit further in the direction where you've gone. You call your work a revisionist, but I would also call it your reconstructing what is obscured by subsequent successful theories. And one of the things you've successfully done is move the conversation beyond a context of two explanations to a context to a contest of four systems of practice, mm-hmm. right? And I just wanna go further and say, if I stand with the people working like Volta and others, are we seeing a lab and actors who are tinkering for effects versus experimenting for explanations versus reconfiguring, building reconfigurations for conceptualization, the way Bacon laid out that you need a series mm. of related phenomena in order to be in touch with what might be the useful concept. So there are three things and, okay, I think I said enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to- there, uh, yes, one thing I didn't thank you go into much in the talk is how the different systems of practice had different types of aims, right? and different emphasis, at least, on the types of aims. So the corpuscular mechanical system was very much focused on explanation, right? How do we explain what happens? Um, It's not that the other systems weren't so interested in explanations, but for them, that's the primary focus. Uh, In other systems, there's more interest in making new types of batteries and creating new kinds of phenomena, right? The, the, um, in the conservationist system, as I call it, the third one, they're very fascinated with doing the interconversion of different types of energy and inventing different kinds of rechargeable batteries and putting that into action, right? So, um, different scientists uh, individually, of course, but also these whole different systems had different types of emphasis on different kinds of aims. And that's one of the really interesting things, I think, uh, about the whole picture. Thank you. Okay, Jane. Um, Yes, thank you very much, Hazard. Really interesting as usual. Um, I was particularly interested when you said that um, the chemical, what is it, chemical mm-hmm. potential. Mm-hmm. Chemical yeah. potential, yeah. Uh-huh. Yes, couldn't be worked out um, from scratch, if you like. They had to be mm. always referred back to the Daniel yeah. um, cell, which is really interesting. And it made me think of the um, case of the magnetometer, the Ham- Hamsteed magnetometer, where uh-huh. everything really go back to that one instrument. So the instrument is yeah. really important. But within a couple of decades, that had become more generalized um, uh-huh. because of a new instrument. Did the same thing happen with the, because I mean, I, I don't know much about the chem. Right. Sort of how, how long was the Daniel cell? 
this sort of paramount instrument and if so for how long did that develop? yeah 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 thank you so this is an intriguing story so the daniel cell the, the thing that daniel invented uh in 1836 it became a paramount practical instrument for oh. several decades right oh. because it was so steady and so powerful in its actual output and as I was briefly mentioning, it even became the unit of voltage, right? Just over one volt. But what it didn't become until much later is this theoretical paradigm that, that we think of it as, right? Because yeah. that doesn't come in until um, the arrival of physical chemistry, really, towards the end of the 19th century. Two ironic things. One is that um, just as the Daniel cell becomes this textbook theoretical battery, it goes out of practical use. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot better practical batteries like these guys, which are invented in the late 19th century. Nobody wants to mess with the wet Daniel cell sloshing around anymore practically. So that's one irony. The other is um, in the early days of physical chemistry, right? People like Oswald and Nernst had hopes of computing from first principles what these chemical potentials, the redox potentials would be, and they failed, right? They just couldn't do it theoretically, which is why it went into this phenomenological solution of right, comparing each type of half cell with a uh, hydrogen uh, electrode. And I don't think that theory ever managed to get to the point of being able to compute all these uh, <laughs> electrode potentials. I think there's still phenomenological values that you find in the CRC handbook or whatever you look up. Gosh, thank you. But it, it really works. Right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, George Borg. Hi. Um, hi, George. <laughs> hi, nice to see you again. Thanks for your um, thanks for your talk. I'm looking forward to uh, reading your book. Uh, I'm just wondering if you are um, drawing any strong sort of incommensurability type conclusions from this work. Um, you know, I'm thinking back to your work on oxygen and phlogiston, and mm -hmm. you know, different ontological principles underlying the systems of practice. Um, do you, um, is, is that, is that pl uh, playing a role here? Good question. So there is a kind of, at least a practical incommensurability in the sense that if you ask the electrochemist today, how the battery works, they can give you a whole story with, with no mention of the voltaic contact potential. So there's a whole story, right? With no mention of the contact potential. If you ask the physicist, they will talk, talk to you about the contact potential. So there are two stories, which apparently don't need each other. Right? And if you try to pick up a textbook of electrochemistry and translate what they're saying into the voltaic terms of contact potential, that's extremely hard to do, right? So in that sense, I think there was incommensurability, at least between the first two systems. And then, I mean, there, there's, there, there are other aspects of Kuhnian incommensurability, like standards of judgment and what you consider important problems. That's certainly there. But the semantic aspect, I think, is at least partly there, but not so much with the third and fourth systems, because Everyone picked up, found a way, every system found a way of talking about energy. Right? So energy becomes almost like the periodic table. Everybody uses it, although not exactly in the same way. And similarly, the, the corpuscular mechanical story is at least supposed to be compatible with every other story we tell, right? In practice, that's not so easy, right? Not so easy to tell the corpuscular mechanical story of something like the contact potential 
because <laughs> to, to really get into that, you need quantum mechanics and quantum mechanics isn't corpuscular mechanical in this traditional sense, right? So it gets very messy, but yeah. So I would say in short, yeah, there are some aspects at least of incommensurability, but, but I wouldn't draw a simple conclusion of incommensurability. So it's not gonna be as like clear cut as, right, relatively clear cut as the sort of principalism versus no, composition. That's of right. Not, of the chemical it's not, right, it's not that clear. And this picture of this battery science is fully pluralistic, really. There, there are these four systems developing at once and they're not, I mean, despite this historiographical bias of seeing this contact versus chemical clash, that's really not the main story as I see it in the whole story. The, the main story is more about each of these systems developing and then the, this ad hoc integrations that people make in order to solve specific problems. So I mentioned explaining the Volta type cells. It's also a question of how do you make these AA batteries that we know today? It's a question of how do we understand what we call potential? So that's a theoretical problem that's not easy to solve in any of the systems. So it is a much more mixed up complex picture than the titanic struggle of two paradigms as Kuhn like to give us. Thanks. And I think that's a really good point on which <laughs> Um, there's just one comment from Carmen Duranta, who says, mm -hmm. very talk, Professor Fabrizzi mentioned Como. I recommend a visit to the Tempio mm -hmm. Voltiano to see some of his apparatus. That's somewhere I've never visited, but it's high on my list uh, mm -hmm. of places to visit at some point. So I think we just sort of come to an end. That's the, uh, we won't be running another seminar in this series until some point in the autumn, probably, probably September. Uh, but in the meantime, on June the 17th, we have the Shack Summer event at the Chelsea Physic Garden, which, if you've never been there, is well worth visiting its own right, as well as coming to uh, hear the Shack, uh, Shack event, which uh, includes, as the, as the speakers, um, Ernst Homburg and Elaine uh, Leong. Um, and it just remains for me to sort of thank everybody involved um, to, to put on a... Um, Zoom stroke uh, YouTube seminar requires quite a large number of people to sort of coordinate over, over a period of a month or so before and on the day. So those people who've been involved, uh, Anna, Anna Simmons, who's done all the IT today, despite, despite coming to go on holiday uh, tomorrow, um, Rob Johnson, Karen Cobble, Becky Martin, Chris Campbell, and Joe Henderson, and of course, uh, Hassett for providing a wonderful uh, uh, trader, I suppose is the best word, uh, for his new book. So thank, thank you, Hasek. Thank you. And have a good evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you happen to be in the world. It's all great advantage of Zoom. <laughs> you can pretend to say